Hello again. Here's what's happened in the last couple of hours uh, out of Ukraine and developments surrounding it. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg says Russia's rhetoric is reckless and dangerous as he responded to Russia's nuclear readiness. During a press briefing at the end of the NATO summit today, he mentioned China asking the country to stop threatening Taiwan and not create a dangerous situation in that part of the world because what happens there also matters to NATO. He, however, refused to be drawn on whether the alliance would come to Taiwan's aid if it was attacked by China. He also responded to Russia's indignation at Finland and Sweden joining NATO, saying those countries had a right to choose their own path. He rejected the idea that NATO is partly responsible for the Ukraine war, saying that Russian President Vladimir Putin does not like having a free, democratic, successful nation on his borders. Meanwhile, the United States President President Joe Biden says he will be announcing a further $800 million worth of military aid for Ukraine in the coming days. He suggests it will cover air defense, artillery, counter-battery systems and other weaponry. It's the latest in a series of announcements of support the U.S. has given Ukraine since Russia's invasion began in, on February 24th. And more than 50 countries have pledged new commitments for Ukraine, including more than 600 tanks, nearly 500 artillery systems, more than 600,000 rounds of artillery ammunition, and advanced multiple rocket systems, anti-ship systems, and air defense systems. President Biden says he recalls warning the Russian president before the war that if he invaded Ukraine, NATO would not only get stronger, it would get more united, and the world would stand up and oppose his aggression. The British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has also been speaking on NATO's unity amid the ongoing Russian invasion of Ukraine. And much earlier today, he said the invasion was bringing NATO to Russia's doorstep and that President Vladimir Putin's actions had made the alliance stronger and united the West. And on allegations about NATO being a threat to Russia, Johnson says it never was remotely likely that Ukraine would join NATO in the foreseeable future before the war. He also says it is up to the people of Ukraine to decide if and when they want to strike a deal with Russia to get peace, saying, we can't be more Ukrainian than the Ukrainians. Everybody understands that. But he says it's seen that in a poll after the attack on the shopping mall in Kremenchuk, 89% of Ukrainians would, under no circumstances, contemplate a land for peace deal. Well, more now from the NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, who says Sweden and Finland will, on Tuesday next week, sign the NATO accession protocol to formally join the alliance. A comment comes a days after Turkey lifted its veto over the bid by both countries to join the alliance after the three nations agreed to protect each other's security. The accession protocol must, however, be ratified by all 30 allied parliaments to allow both countries to become part of NATO and benefit from the alliance's collective defense clause. We have also taken to do the formal signing of the accession protocol on Tuesday uh, with the presence of the uh, Swedish and Finnish uh, foreign ministers. But, but the reality, the decision has uh, been decided already with the political decision by all the leaders. We have also taken note of the messages from Moscow, actually, uh, that uh, it doesn't change so much, uh, much that Finland and Sweden are joining the alliance. Well, they have communicated different messages from Moscow on that issue. Uh, the most important thing for us is that Finland and Sweden uh, will become members of uh, the alliance. We are there to protect all allies and, of course, also Finland and Sweden, and we are prepared for all eventualities. We are trying to facilitate some kind of agreement. Um, also, Greece announced that they are ready to uh, make available ships to get uh, uh, grain out of uh, Ukraine. Uh, and other allies are involved in different diplomatic efforts to get some kind of agreement uh, to allow ships to sail uh, with food, wheat, uh, 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 over the Black uh, Sea. Uh, then, um, Lithuania... And the Russian president, on the other hand, says Russia would respond in kind if NATO destroys troops and infrastructure in Finland and in Sweden after they join the alliance. Speaking after meeting with regional leaders in the ex-Soviet state of Turkmenistan, President Putin said, with Sweden and Finland, we do not have problems that we have with Ukraine. They want to join NATO. 
Go ahead, but they must understand there was no threat before. While well, now, if military contingents and infrastructure are deployed there, we will have to respond in kind and create the same threats for the territories from which threats towards us are created. He said it was inevitable that Moscow's relations with Helsinki and Stockholm would sour over their NATO membership. Everything was fine between us, he says, but now there might be some tensions. There certainly will. It's inevitable if there is a threat to us. Now, earlier today, Estonia's Prime Minister Kaya Kallas said Russia would not respond to Sweden and Finland by triggering a conventional war over their accession to NATO. Kallas said Russian President Vladimir Putin would more likely respond through hybrid warfare methods. Uh, of course, we have to expect uh, some kind of uh, uh, surprises from uh, from Putin, but uh, I doubt that he uh, is attacking Sweden or, or Finland directly. We, we will see uh, cyber attacks, definitely. We will see hybrid attacks. Uh, information war is going on, but uh, uh, not the conventional war. I doubt it. This is a style of this regime to, to try to scare us, to, to show us as a weak, as not decisive, but I think we have to prove, and we have historic opportunity to prove that this time everything will be different. And Europe, NATO will be strong, will take all necessary actions, and Putin this time will be put to the place where it, he should be. Yellow Russian hospitals who, 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 who contain uh, Russian uh, soldiers and they, 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 they receive the medical support in, in, in these hospitals. But I don't think that, that the Belarusian authorities and, and, and the Belarusian society will decide to, 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 to enter to this war and to support uh, Russia in their aggression against Ukraine. Now, China, which had received some lashing from NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg earlier, said that the first new strategic concept in a decade for NATO, which cites Russia, cites China, big pardon, as a concern for the first time, disregards facts and wrongly defines the country's intentions. Foreign Ministry spokesperson Zhao Lijiang says it speaks ill of China's normal military de development and national defense policy, is irresponsible, encourages confrontation, and is full of Cold War thinking and ideological prejudice. NATO, in its new strategic concept unveiled on Wednesday for the first time, described China as a challenge to NATO's interests, security and values. As an economic and military power that remains opaque about strategy, intentions and military buildup. Chinese state media had also warned against South Korea and Japan attending the NATO summit and criticized the alliance's broadening partnerships in Asia. So not everyone feels the North Atlantic Treaty Organization has been as effective as it should be. Some experts are saying in light of recent events, NATO should be dismantled. NATO members have been meeting for almost 48 hours in Spain amid mounting criticisms of the alliance's aggressive security policy and lingering conflicts among its members. Not even Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg's press conference on Wednesday, saying leaders had decided to transform and strengthen the alliance as a pivotal time for their security, did anything to allay negative feelings towards the alliance. Right in Madrid, where the summit held, demonstrators called for peace and protest against the summit. Some local residents expressed belief that NATO's expansion will never bring peace to the world and called for the dismantling of the U.S.-led organization. Some scholars in Spain also believe that NATO is not necessary and the member countries should depend on themselves on national defense. NATO shall disappear. Since the United States will one day admit that Europe is not the client state, the NATO members should undertake responsibility for national security defense in accordance with their own interests. For example, there is no conflict between Spain and Russia, so the Russia-Ukraine conflict should not have had impact on Spain. But the only role NATO has played is creating conflict. 
Founder of the French Center for Intelligence Studies, Eric Dunez, says he believes NATO as a tool to the United States to control Europe should have already been dismantled. Since the disintegration of the Soviet Union and the end of the Warsaw Pact, dismantling NATO should have been the right thing for us. NATO is a tool used by the United States to control Europe and the world. If it had been dismantled, there would have been no NATO expansion and the Russian-Ukraine conflict. This is very important since the provocations of the West, especially the United States, and the expansion of NATO have forced Russia to take action. Many also believe that NATO's expansion east of Europe is the root cause of the Russia-Ukraine crisis. So NATO has always been an uh, imperialist aggression organization. And now in Ukraine, uh, they planned this for many years. The movement east of NATO is clearly not defensive, it's clearly aggressive, placing these missile systems along the Russian border from uh, Poland down through Romania. So the Russians said, you can't do this. Their power is weakening and for all sorts of reasons we know but that makes them desperate, so they're trying to keep their position somehow. But it means more war, I think. In the meantime, Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez says that he will urge fellow allies to consider a bigger role for the alliance in North Africa and the Sahel, and that intervention in Mali should not be ruled out. Western powers are concerned about a spike in violence in Mali, where the country's ruling militia junta, backed by Russian private military contractor Wagner Group, is battling an Islamist insurgency that spills into neighboring countries in the African region, known as the Sahel. The residents of Ukrainian capital Kyiv will welcome the news of Russian forces abandoning the strategic Black Sea outpost of Snake Island, a major victory for Ukraine that could loosen the grip of Russia's blockade on Ukrainian ports. Russia's defense ministry said it had decided to withdraw from the outcrop as a gesture of goodwill to show Moscow was not obstructing UN efforts to open a humanitarian corridor allowing grains to be shipped from Ukraine. Ukraine said it had driven the Russian forces out after massive artillery and assault overnight. Snake Island has held the world's attention since Russia seized it on the war's first day when a Ukrainian guard ordered by Russia's flagship cruiser Moskva to surrender radioed back Russian warship We'll mention the word he said after that. But Ukraine's postal service in April issued one million stamps brandishing the defiant insults to Russia and the image of the Ukrainian Snake Island Guard features on T-shirts, calendars and fridge magnets sold as souvenirs all across Ukraine. Now we're back to the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, who says Moscow is open to a dialogue on strategic stability and nuclear non-proliferation. Despite Russia sending troops into Ukraine on February 24th, both Moscow and Washington have stressed the importance of maintaining communication on the issue of nuclear arms. The two countries are by far the world's largest nuclear powers, with an estimated 11,000 nuclear warheads between them. President Putin said Russia is open to dialogue on ensuring strategic stability, preserving non-proliferation regimes for weapons of mass destruction, and improving the situation in the field of arms control, and that the efforts would require painstaking joint work and would go towards preventing a repeat of what is happening today in the Donbass. The Russian leader says Moscow went into Ukraine to protect ethnic Russians and Russian speakers in the eastern Donbass region from persecution from Kyiv. In another development, the Russian Defense Ministry has said the special military operation in Ukraine has progressed with the elimination of Ukrainian land targets in Lysychansk, while the Ukrainian side reports heavy attacks in multiple regions, including Sumy, Kharkov, and Nikolaev. Defense Ministry spokesman Igor Konanshikov said in a press statement the armed forces of the Russian Federation continue the special military operation in Ukraine. The enemy suffers considerable losses. The 10th Mountain Assault Brigade of the Armed Forces of Ukraine suffered considerable losses during the offensive near Lysychansk or refinery. According to captured servicemen from this brigade, the 108th Battalion has been completely defeated. Only 30 from 350 servicemen remain in this unit. High-precision attacks launched by Russian aerospace forces have resulted in the elimination of four command posts, including those of Kharkov-1, 
and Kharkov, two territorial defense battalions near Kharkov, as well as a training base of mercenaries deployed near Nikolaev. Meanwhile, Russian news agency Ria Novosti has reported that Luhansk forces claim to have taken control of all main roads in and out of Lysychansk, Lysychansk but Ukrainian troops are still trying to advance along several rural dirt roads. But from the Ukrainian side, the Ukrainian news, news agency has reported in the past 24 hours regions of Sumy, Kharkov, and Nikolaev were under massive shelling and missile attacks by Russian forces. The Russian army continues its attack in the direction of Volcheya Karovaka and Verkny Kamenka, trying to encircle the city of Lysychansk. Hundreds of Ukrainian troops have completed military training in Britain, including on the multiple launch rocket systems, according to the British government, which it is supplying to help counter Russian artillery tactics. Ukrainian troops were filmed earlier this week loading and firing 155 millimeter light guns during exercises in Salisbury on one part of a British-led program that has been undertaken by more than 450 Ukrainian armed forces with support from New Zealand. The training is part of a wide-ranging international support package following Russia's invasion earlier this year, as the West seeks to help Ukraine repel Russian forces by providing increasingly advanced weapon systems and skills to use them. Provoked while artillery was involved in the three-week-long training of the MLRS. At the end of the day, it's, it's another component to their, um, their, their orbit, and it's a force multiplier. Um, because it's a track vehicle, their rocket systems are wheeled. It's going to give them more, more mobility, which is going to aid in their survivability. Uh, and naturally, it's uh, uh, an ammunition that's able to punch out to 84 kilometers. Moscow calls its actions in Ukraine Ukrainian counterparts. They are extremely keen to learn. Um, and we have had, had them for long days. Um, we've been teaching them from 8 in the morning till 6 at night, seven days a week for, for the whole period that they've been here. Um, their, their appetite at the beginning was, as you can imagine, extremely high and very needy. Um, but as they've become more, more attuned and accustomed to under his own doctrine and tactics. Well, Ukraine on Wednesday carried out its biggest exchange of prisoners of war since Russia invaded, securing the release of 144 of its soldiers, including 95 who defended Mariupol steel workers. St. Media says the majority of the Ukrainians were badly wounded, suffering from gunshot and shrapnel wounds, blast traumas, burns, fractured bones and amputated limbs. There was no comment from Russia about a prisoner swap, but the head of the self-proclaimed Donetsk People's Republic in eastern Ukraine says it had secured the release of 144 soldiers, including its fighters and those of the Russian army. Hundreds more Ukrainians are still thought to be held by Russia and its pro-Moscow separatist proxies in eastern Ukraine, but their precise whereabouts are not known. Welcome back. So much going on with NATO in Madrid, Spain, as uh, the NATO summit ends in the country, plus uh, developments in Ukraine. Joining me now is foreign affairs commentator Calvin Dar. Calvin, great to see you. Let's dig, get right into it. What do you think leaders achieved uh, with the summit in Madrid, apart from Finland and Sweden, ready to sign the dotted lines with NATO next week? Well, I think that any body in the world that thought that NATO was on the way out, waiting in influence and power. This summit proved that NATO isn't that, and that it can respond to the threats um, that the NATO members and its, and its allies are facing. Apart from the uh, inclusion of Finland and Sweden, we saw for the first time that uh, Asia-Pacific countries and those with interest in that region were um, participating. And this just clearly demonstrates that the focus, security, economic, as well of the NATO members, reaches beyond Europe. Um, into Asia. So I think that's something that will be um, applauded because the strategic concept hadn't been updated in 12 years. And now it's been updated with obviously updated language on Russia, but also towards China. So I think in that sense, they've accomplished a lot. Yeah, and there are some analysts that uh, blame the Russia-Ukraine crisis on NATO's expansion eastwards in Europe, and some believe NATO has outlived its relevance and is only being used by the United States. Your thoughts on that? Well, I think that anybody, that I don't really 
uh, subscribe to that theory because if you think about the Ukraine-Russia conflict, obviously this affects the United States in several ways, but it's in Europe's backyard. And so while I'm sure uh, President Biden was stressing U.S. interests and trying to mold NATO's priorities to fit U.S. interests, countries in Europe have their own interests and their own security and economic and energy situations to think about. So the Russia-Ukraine conflict demonstrated that NATO isn't just about the United States strategic plan or our priorities. But we have seen NATO expanded beyond, you know, its own uh, confines. Uh, NATO might be considered stronger than it was uh, 23 years ago, but it is uh, rubbing some people the wrong way um, because of what's currently going on with Ukraine. And many believe that it was NATO that pushed the Ukrainian president into the situation uh, that Ukraine is today with all the destruction and war that's going on in the country. Yes, but then, you know, let's also think back to before the conflict in Ukraine. That was uh, Putin's main justification, uh, one of his justifications, um, that NATO expansion was a security threat to Russia, which I don't really think that was the case. I think that um, Putin viewed anything stopping R Russia's uh, hegemony expansion in, in, in Europe and with its former um, uh, satellite states as, you know, a threat to them. So I wouldn't blame NATO, although I do think it is worth considering what NATO could have done maybe 2013, 2014, to not have this kind of uh, am, uh, an ambiguous relationship with Ukraine, whether or not they'd be welcomed or not, or what their security situation would be vis-a-vis -vis other NATO allies. That, in that sense, it did probably push this conflict to where it was. But the actual conflict, I think the blame um, is deserved by Putin. And Putin is talking non-proliferation. That's because Sweden and Finland are joining in NATO. And there is come some concern there about Russia's response. Um, the Russian president saying that, you know, if some of the structures, some of its structures, I think, in Sweden and in Finland are destroyed, uh, then it will have to respond. And that's where the concern is, isn't it? Russia's response to the membership of Sweden and Finland. What do you think that could be in the long run? Because let's remember, this is the same president who said he would not invade Ukraine, and then he eventually did. Russian forces are still in Ukraine. So, your thoughts? You, you hit the nail right on the head, as we say here in Washington. My first thing was credibility. Um, Putin lacked credibility with a lot of Western leaders in the United States before the Ukraine um, invasion, and so his credibility is shot now. But even if he was serious about non-proliferation, here's what we do know for sure. What he would ask in exchange for that is more than the U.S. or NATO or anybody in Europe would want to pay, because we realize he's made um, unrealistic demands on Ukraine and the West. So even if he was credible in pursuing non-proliferation, it wouldn't be worth the cost to the U.S. and its allies. China's been dragged into this, and there's no surprise there. That's because of um, Taiwan. And, you know, leaders are worried uh, China could be, uh, you know, you know, take a, a note from Russia's playbook on how to invade Taiwan, although NATO says it does not intend, it's not sure yet whether it will be uh, coming to Taiwan's defense. But the Chinese government also is uh, unhappy about what NATO's rhetoric is uh, in recent days. Um, NATO's interests, uh, security and values, it says, as an economic and military power remains opaque. Uh, no, NATO says China's interests, security and values as an economic and military power remains opaque and about its strategy, intentions, the military buildup. I mean, there's no lie about this. I mean, it's hard to read China these days, right? Yes. And I think, you know, when we were just saying a few moments ago, you know, what's the U.S. role in NATO or, you know, is the U.S. using it as a tool for its own um, international ambitions? I think this is definitely a case where um, President Biden, uh, used his influence to make the um, relationships, not only with the U.S., but with NATO countries, with China a top priority, because one of, that's one of the U.S.'s top priorities. I think, you know, that that what we saw as a, came about with the G7 summit when they were trying to come up with ways to um, counter China economically and investment-wise with the um, Belt, Belt and Road Initiative. So uh, it, it's, it makes total sense that NATO 
would be drawn into this. Now, the other part is with Taiwan, because I think that's something that interests just beyond the United States and beyond NATO, that we don't want China or anyone else seeing what happened with Ukraine, thinking that they could possibly do the same thing in Taiwan in this case. Yeah, because China always keeps its cards close to its chest is also the reason it's not part of the G7 today. Calvin, thank you again. Thank you.